Okay, so this is this is the uh, lunch for today. <laughs> this is our lunch. I hope you're hungry. <laughs> I hope you're hungry. You didn't have any breakfast. So this is the uh, lunch for today. It's a mix of uh, a lot of local things, but also influence from the world. So here goes the taste test. Very nice. You can certainly taste the mint. Can you taste the ginger? And the ginger. Mm -hmm. Very sweet. Very sweet. Very nice though. It's day two in Israel and I'm very, very lucky to be joined by a very, very famous guy here in Israel, David Hyman. David, you are a supreme tour guide here. Tell us what we're going to be doing today. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David. I'm a tour guide in Israel. My videos are about Israel. So today's tour, we're going to visit some of the highlights of Haifa. I think we're going to start up on the mountain on Carmel. We're going to see the monastery talk about the Carmelites what all Carmel is all about and then maybe talk a little bit about the Baha'is and see the Baha'i gardens and then maybe drive around the bay and visit the old city of Akko. I think that could be a fun morning for us today, Chris. Lovely, cannot wait. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Dave, what do you say to people when they say, is Israel safe to visit? I say that there's um, a risk of traveling anywhere in the world, even in your own hometown. Uh, Israel, for me, is the safest place in the world. Uh, we have uh, areas of unrest. I don't go there with my groups. Uh, we stay in the areas that are um, relatively peaceful. Uh, I'm in constant contact with the authorities. If there is some unrest, they let me know in my phone where to stay away from. 99% um, of the time, it is completely peaceful. Israel is, has, does not have any street crime. I know in many countries, many towns in Europe, they tell you don't go to the river, don't go to the beach, don't go to the park, don't go out at night. Here, we don't have that. You can go anywhere you want to go, even if you're a solo travel, even if you're a female solo traveler. It is so, so safe. Uh, that's my answer. How, how did you become a tour guide here? Uh, so 20 years ago, I decided that I wanted to be independent and I followed my passion for history, archeology, span that's what I studied. And I took the tour guide, Israeli tour guides course and I became a tour guide. You need to wear a license. This is my license. Uh, I have a touring van and uh, groups are welcome to join me in my van and tour wonderful Israel. It is to this monastery, which is on the top of Mount Carmel. Uh, we say Har Carmel. It's the proper pronunciation. It's the mountain that Haifa is built on. It's a historic mountain. It's a real, it's a holy mountain. And uh, this monastery commemorates an event that happened here, which we're going to see and uh, talk about. So uh, the church is called Stella Maris, Stella, star, Maris, the sea, the star of the sea, uh, which is uh, one of the um, references to the Virgin Mary. But uh, the story we're going to talk about here actually is about this figure who is on the doors of the monastery holding a flame in his hand and there's something going on this is elijah elijah the prophet okay so let's visit the chapel and then talk back outside because inside there are explanations She, she is the star of the sea. She is the Stella Maris, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. A Virgin Mary. But the low altar is in a cave, a natural cave. In the rocks of the mountain. Carved 
into the rocks of the mountain. Then they answered the king. And here it says, Elias Tishabite. Tishabite means he is from the town of Tishbi. Tishbi is in Transjordan today, it's on the other side of the Jordan River. That's the hometown of Elijah, Elijah the Tishabite. So this is the cave of Elijah, one of many. I must be, uh, it's just that there's traditions on where exactly did Elijah camp on Mount Carmel. Yeah. So there's a few options. This is one of them. Sure of Elijah. Elijah himself, a uh, statue, he, he always looks fierce, um, angry, zealous. Okay, we'll talk about that a little later. That's his character. Uh, we can see that a lot of the uh, references are, are in Arabic because in Haifa there is an Arab speaking Catholic community. Sounds strange, but in Israel everything is possible. Mm. Okay, there are Catholic Christians living in Haifa who speak Arabic. This is their parish church. They come here on their, you know, every day. Today is Saturday, so it's a bit quiet, but tomorrow there'll be mass here for the community. <laughs> I tell you, David is such a knowledgeable guy. Extremely friendly, stops to talk to absolutely everybody. A wonderful tour guide. Do check out his YouTube channel. David, what a view. What a view. Isn't this beautiful down here? Yeah, this is the most famous landmark of Haifa, the Baha'i Shrine, the Temple of the Baha'is. Uh, this is a religion. They're a religion on their own. They broke away from Islam about 200 years ago, founded their own uh, religion. Um, as if there's not enough stepping on each other's toes in this country, with the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians. Now we have the Baha'is, like, welcome. We've got room for everyone. Okay, so the Baha'is chose Haifa as their center. Uh, actually, for a reason, I think the reason is based on what we just saw. They knew that Carmel is a holy mountain. They saw this was available. They came here 200 years ago and they chose Carmel as their center. Uh, and uh, the Golden Shrine is the founder of the Baha'i faith is buried there. His name was the Baha'u'llah. He is a Persian, was a Persian prophet. And uh, he was actually executed in Persia. His followers were sent to prison in Akko, which is the town we're going to go later, across the bay. Right across the other side of the bay, there's the old city of Akko. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were imprisoned in Akko, and from their cell window, they could see Mount Carmel, and they decided to bury the, the, the prophet of their faith here when they can have access. And that happened 50 years later, in 1909. They brought him here, they buried him under that building, covered him with a golden dome, planned and designed the beautiful gardens and this is the most famous landmark of Haifa, the Baha'i Gardens. Britain built it. <laughs> you know, the Britain with the government here for 30 years. Uh, after World War I, uh, the empires carved the Middle East and every empire took a big bite. Britain took the biggest bite. Uh, so this was all under the Britain Empire, British Empire, Palestine, Iraq, Transjordan, Saudi Arabia, I think a lot of Egypt. This was all part of the British Empire. And they wanted to connect all the pieces of the British Empire with trains and also bringing the shipping the treasures from one place to the other. So the oil wells are in Saudi Arabia and in Iraq. And how do you get it to Britain? With a pipe all the way to the port of Haifa. And they build the whole port and the refineries and all the oil establishments were built by Britain in the 1920s and 30s. And Haifa is based on British plan, uh, city plan. Wow. 
There's the port. The pipes came in from Iraq. The refineries were here, and from here the oil was shipped to back home. To and then when the Brits left and we moved in, we inherited the port from Britain. It was built. So this is the oil port over there, the commercial port, and down there is the navy. Now it's the navy. I don't know. You can even see some navy uh, boats. You can see there. You see the big white building. Yeah. White building is our granary. We buy our wheat. Our grain comes from Ukraine, actually. <laughs> so behind the big white granary, you can see a few military navy boats parked like that. Battleships. See them? And there's one over there. So this is our navy. One of our navy bases. So there's the navy base. There's the commercial port here. This is where this area here is where the cruise ships come to Haifa, dock in Haifa. And then there is the commercial, and over there is the oil port. So Haifa is all about the port. Growing faith. Um, I think there is about five million followers of the Baha'is today. Uh, it's kind of amazing that their center, their world center, is here in Haifa. Out of all places in the world, they're here in Haifa. This is where they're based. Uh, it's a faith without clergy. There's no ministers, there's no priests, there's no pope. It's all elected commission, elected councils. And they rotate the jobs. It's very liberal. It's very progressive. It's very peaceful. Um, you cannot be born Baha'i. You grow, uh, you, uh, they raise their children to the age of 15 without a faith. And then at the age of 15 they can choose if they want to join the Baha'is and become Baha'i or not. This I never remember, so I always bring their brochure with me. Um, the fundamentals of their faith are abandonment of all forms of prejudice, uh, full equality between the sexes, recognition of the common source and essential oneness of the world's great religions, elimination of the extremes of poverty and wealth, universal compulsory education, uh, right and responsibility of each person to search independently for the truth. This is interesting, establishment of a world federal system. They don't want countries. They think that the, because we're divided into countries, that's the source of a lot of violence and unrest in the world. Mm. Let's just be one federal, yeah? Uh, and the recognition that faith must be consistent with reason and that science and religion should be in harmony. Baha'i World Center. Okay, welcome to the city of Acre. Acre, we pronounce it Ako in this country. Uh, we drove around the Haifa Bay. So this is the historic or the ancient city of the Haifa Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason it's here is because there was a natural cove for the ancient people that needed a port. So the port of Ako, the harbor of Ako, is one of the oldest in our region, uh, mentioned in the Bible. And it served the Galilee region that needed a port to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, but we're going to fast forward uh, the period, the time uh, frame we're going to discuss in the city of Akko are the Crusades, the Crusaders, the European Catholics that came to the Holy Land in the 12th and the 13th century, century and uh, created a kingdom, the Jerusalem, King, correct, the Jerusalem Crusader Kingdom. Uh, Akko was their uh, gate or their door in and out of the Holy Land. And uh, this building, it's new. This is Ottoman. This is Turkish. This is 200 years old. But it's built on the foundations of the Crusader fortress that was here. So that's the tour now. We're going to go in underneath, inside and underneath, and visit a site that's called the Knights Halls and talk a little bit about the Crusades, the Crusaders, who they are, where did they come from, and what were they searching here in the Holy Land. Fantastic. All right? Yeah. And dirt and earth all the way to the roof. And uh, it was, they started exposing this about 20 years ago and revealing an underground subterranean crusader city. 
it was buried underneath the ruins of Akko. And Israel did a really beautiful job of, well, this is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which means you get a grant from the UN. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money needed to do this big project. Yeah. And they started cleaning out the halls one after the other. So now there's four halls, halls that are open for the public. This is called the Northern Hall. I actually call this the hospital. Uh, the organization that are welcoming the pilgrims that are coming from Europe are called the Hospitallers. It's, these are knights. It's an order of Christians. There are priests and there are soldiers. Today, it doesn't make sense that you would be both. But back then, it was very common that a person would take the vows and he would be loyal to his landlord and he would be a soldier, but also would be a priest. Like he took the vows of chastity and, 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 and um, poverty and obedience. So these hospitalers, um, I mean, today we use the, the word hospital to give medical care, but we also use the word hospitality just to be hospitable and welcome someone in the hotel. Yeah. Why are these two words similar? These two services once were provided by one organization. You would arrive from the boat into the port of Akko, and they would send you to this room, and you would be put into one of the wards according to how healthy you are. If you're completely healthy, it's just hospitality. Take a bed and a, a, room and a few meals, and when you're feeling better, you continue your journey to Jerusalem. If you're not feeling well, we can take care of you. Now we're a hospital. So, here, when the sick man shall come, let him, I mean, I don't know if you want to be the person being operated by these medieval doctors. You see? Doesn't look like a, but maybe, you know. And each one, I think, would be according to the level of your health. Okay, a healthy person, sick person. Uh, this is just a station on the journey. The journey actually only ends when you get to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Century Crusader building. European. Um, they call this Romanesque, this style. Okay, that's the a very shallow arch. I to bring it back to life as a commercial, but it, it's, you see the shops are, there's not enough traffic. It needs to be really, really busy for shop owners to rent these and sell stuff. It is a masterpiece. I mean, we have no wood in this country, hardly any trees. So the only way to, to cover a roof or a ceiling, which is the heavy rock, needs to be supported. So how, can it, how, can it, how are you going to support such a heavy ceiling? You need these three massive pillars and arches that go in all directions. And that would be enough support to keep create such a large space. Uh, we're going to visit a mosque. <laughs> uh, Israel there are 10 million Israelis. Out of the 10 million Israelis, 2 million are not Jewish, which means they are either Christian or Muslim. Actually, 90% of them are Muslim. So I know that it's a big surprise, but we live pretty much in harmony and side by side, mixed cities like Akko. And uh, in Akko, there's a mosque that we can visit. Uh, so this will be a wonderful opportunity to talk a little bit about Islam. And um, Ottoman period uh, Akko from the 18th century. So this is the Al Jazar Mosque of Akko, uh, built around the middle of the 18th century in the late 1700s by uh, the governor of Akko. His name was uh, Ahmad Pasha Al Jazar. That was his name. He started his career as a tax collector. Uh, but then was given authority by the Ottoman Sultan to be the governor of the whole region. Uh, he is famous for being a, kind of a cruel leader. Uh, al jaza means the cutter, the butcher. If you uh, uh, got in his way or he was in a bad mood, he would cut off either a finger or your nose or your ear. So that's his name, al jaza But he's also famous because he is the Ottoman governor who managed to uh, fight a battle against Napoleon and defeat Napoleon. It's one of the only, it's one of the few battles in the world that Napoleon lost. The other one you know, Waterloo, 
but the second one is the Battle of Akko. And Jazar himself was the, uh, was the uh, general of this battle. He was supported by the British fleet, it is true, but Napoleon lost the Battle of Akko 1799 to this guy, Al Jazar. The house of worship, uh, it's empty. The beauty of mosques is that they're empty. There's no statues, no idols, no art. Just a large space for the people to gather and pray five times a day facing the holy city of Mecca. And uh, what's wonderful about this mosque is that we are allowed in and to visit bet between the prayer hours. Like when they're praying, they would close the door. But when they're not, they're open, welcoming us to see. Um, the, the green plaques are the names of Allah, the name of, of God and the name of Prophet Muhammad. And look around you, it's, the whole decoration is without using any images. In Islam, uh, they're very sensitive to what we would call the second commandment, no images. So if you are a Muslim artist, and you can use images of animals and humans, and even plants sometimes are um, not acceptable, then what's left? Geometry, color, mosaics, and calligraphy. So they have perfected what they can use in their art. That's why Islamic art is so beautiful, because think of it, three, seven, 1300 years, Muslim artists have very little to use, to play with, so they brought it to a level which is un, really, really uh, exquisite. So we have now stopped for lunch. David? Yeah. Tell me what we can expect for lunch. What are the uh, specialties here? We're at the um, restaurant of Mr. Muallim, my friend from Akko. He runs this place with his wife and his boys. Uh, they serve the local cuisine, Middle Eastern food. There'll be lots of salads on the table. There'll be falafel, hummus, uh, pita bread, everything freshly made from every morning. And uh, it's going to be a treat. I'm looking forward to it. They put mint in it, so it's lemonana. Okay, so this is this is our lunch for today. <laughs> this is our lunch. I hope you're hungry. <laughs> I hope you're hungry. You didn't have any breakfast. So this is our lunch for today. It's a mix of uh, a lot of local things, but also influence from the world. Like the fries, which would not be a local thing. But the basic food is the hummus, chickpeas with olive oil, baba ganoush, eggplant, beets, sal beet salad, turnip, falafel, chickpeas. This is chicken shawarma. And uh, two kinds of salads, potato. Um, this is a treat just because he likes you. You get a bit of shrimp. <laughs> and the um, bon appetit. Fantastic. So David, what have we got now? This is uh, just a, a taste of the Turkish coffee. Always drink it black, okay? No sugar, no milk, like this. And uh, dates. Okay, these are the Majul dates, so. Cheers. Cheers. So David, we've just had a delicious lunch and now we're on the way to the market. What can we expect in the market here? Well, what I like about the market here in Acre, in Akko, is that it's really authentic. Uh, the, city, the old city of Akko is, is a living city. Um, people live here and this is where they do their shopping. Mm -hmm. So the Akko market has the trinkets and the knickknacks and the souvenirs, but also has things that a person would need for his house. They would come here to do their shopping. They would come here to get their, their fish and their meat and their fruit and their vegetables and their coffee and their um, bread and products. So. Uh, it's really authentic. I think it's maybe the, one of the last places in the, in Israel that are still have that ambience of a real place. Yeah. See the dress code. You know we have. This is uh, the coffee place. Salam alaikum. How are you? Good. Um, the gentleman sells all these kind of coffees. You can choose your blend and grind it on the street.
السلام عليكم كيف انت كيكس بيستريز with different fillings this is filled with cheese chocolate this is zata it's hisa it's like a herb a herb you put on the pita now it's fig season fresh figs cane we remember we saw in the crusader building sugar cane was the economy of this region <laughs> it's kind of nice to just still see he puts the sugar cane through that machine and they people drink the mm. sugar drink. See, it squeezes the, sh the sugar out of the cane. See? Yeah. So I've got to try one of these. So here goes the taste test. Very nice. You can certainly taste the mint. Can you taste the ginger? And the ginger. Mm -hmm. Very sweet. Very sweet. Very nice though. Mm -hmm. The origin is actually from Turkey, from Istanbul. But because the Ottoman Empire over were all, all, everywhere for 400 years, their desserts have been spread out all over the Middle East. So this is called kanafe. over there see the city with the towers that's where we they see the Baha'i gardens even yeah okay we were there in the morning looking over this side YouTube <laughs> <laughs> That was back like in, in the 1990s, 20 years ago. Turns out that under our house, there's an ancient crusader tunnel. Now they call it a Templar tunnel. This is all genuine 12th century. <laughs> it was underneath the city. No one knew about it until the lady. Wow. <laughs> so they cleaned it out, they fixed it up, they put a path, they put in these screens. They turned it into a tourist attraction. I think it's really, really nice. So it has been a really, really busy morning here in Haifa and surrounding areas and a really, really big thank you to David Hyman, a wonderful tour guide who showed me around today, um, showed me all of the interesting places to visit here in Haifa and all of the surrounding areas. Um, you can actually get in contact with David via his website and he also has a YouTube channel as well. It is called Israel with David Hyman. I will put all of the links below. Please do subscribe to his channel. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you don't subscribe to this channel as yet, please do hit that subscribe button and I will see you on the next one. Until then, come on you Spurs.